be a bit intense because I've got quite a lot that I want to get through today. I am going to talk about navigating the public debate about sexuality. Has that come up yet? Because it seems to me that this is an area in which Christians have really been beaten out of the public square. We're being told that we're hateful bigots continually and that uh, our views need to be silenced because they're actually killing people, that uh, Christianity is actually inconsistent with a uh, healthy life and flourishing for LGBT people. And one of the things that's happening uh, is in all the mudslinging and the name calling is that we've lost the ability to sort of stand back and understand why different people have different points of view and to examine the belief systems behind that. So I was studying this recently and it occurred to me that we're actually, there's three parts to this national conversation and each one appeals to very different views of human ontology. Ontology is that branch of philosophy that is interested in the nature of things. What is something? What, what is the nature of humanity? What is, how does human sexuality fit in with that? How is it different for different people? And depending on what you believe about the human person, then you will come up with very different ideas about what you believe is good for the human person. And that then flows on to the sexuality debate. So I've come up with a little schema that I think might help us to understand who's who in the zoo. <laughs> and really there are three different parts that I'll be examining. The first one is the Judeo-Christian view of, um, of humanity and the role of human sexuality. And that appeals to the importance of sexual morality. The second part of the conversation, which is actually a mainstream view, which appeals to an idea of sexual orientation, and we'll be unpacking that. And then towards the end, I'll explain what the sexual rights activists believe, and they argue for sexual diversity or sexual liberation. Now, quite often, people think that sexual diversity and sexual orientation are different ways of talking about the same thing, but these two different distinct groups uh, uh, appeal to different views of humanity and of, sexu of sexuality, so that will become clear as we go along. But we'll start off with common ground that we're, we're all familiar with, which is the Judeo-Christian view of human sexuality. So according to the Judeo-Christian view of humanity to begin with, everyone is equal in inherent human dignity. Everyone is an intentional creation of God. Human nature is sinful, but we are not slaves to sin. We can choose not to act on our sinful natures. And sexual sin is possible for everyone. So depravity is not confined to particular types of people. And that's quite egalitarian, really, because sexual temptation needs to be resisted by everyone everywhere. Because we believe sexual sin hurts ourselves and others, it's important that we resist it. So in this view, there's a, a moral imperative that comes from the understanding that sexual sin can be harmful. Because God loves the sinner, he hates the sin. And this results in a very narrow sexual ethic. Sex is okay within marriage, for intimacy and procreation, and nowhere else for any purpose. But on the other hand, we think that sexuality is a small and perhaps reasonably insignificant part of the total human identity. So in this view, celibacy is both possible and harmless, regardless of what Freud had to say on the subject, sexual inhibition is unproblematic. Now, there's a, an idea that Christians are often blamed for, which is the connection of identity and behavior in the character of the homosexual with a capital H. Um, I studied medieval history. My mother was very worried that I wouldn't get a job so I quite like to sort of throw in a little snippet from medieval history out every now and then just to prove to her that it actually was worthwhile, all that expensive university education. Am I on the right slide? No. Yes, going back. Okay, so from the 12th century, in the uh, medieval penitentials, you have sodomy listed as a sin. It's part of a group of sins classed as luxuria. It's a type of self-indulgence. It goes along with gluttony and the love of fine clothing. But we don't have, in Christian thought, the character of the sodomite or the homosexual, the personification of this sin. And this is actually a product of the Enlightenment, not of Christian thought. We get blamed for it, but it doesn't come from us. And Foucault, who is not normally on the side of Christians, agrees that this was um, a, the product of, a, of an era when moral authority was being transferred from the church to science. And so they needed a scientific basis for justifying the moral order that categorised some things as moral and others as immoral. 
And so what we have is the development of the homosexual as a sort of depraved personality, similar to the lunatic. In fact, the Victorians were very keen that all sexual excess should be associated with lunacy, mental illness, and all sorts of other depravity and moral decay. And the homosexual is a product of this sort of belief system. And as Foucault explains to us, nothing that went into the homosexual's total composition was unaffected by his sexuality. It was everywhere present in him. It was at the root of all of his actions. So in this idea of the homosexual, the behaviour has colonised the entire human identity. There's really nothing left. This person is just the personification of a sin. And this is actually a very unhelpful way to look at people, and it's not a Christian idea. And really, we're dealing with a legacy issue then, because people would be saying, well, the homo some homosexuals are nice people. They're not all depraved. And we've been trying to redeem this pathologised identity. And in fact, Christians shouldn't have anything to do with that. That's not a hill we need to die on. We don't need to defend the homosexual, because that's not our debate at all. Because in Christian thought, identity and behaviour are separate things. But it has now been reclaimed, and it's sort of a legacy issue because it feeds into this mainstream belief of sexual orientation. Somebody fell off their chair the other day when I said homosexuals weren't born that way. Everyone believes that homosexuals are born that way, surely. I don't. <laughs> I've got one ally in the room. <laughs> we need to persuade others of this. So, but there is this common understanding, it's a, in the popular belief system, that sexual orientation is a thing, that it's innate, it's unchosen, and it's fixed, so it's analogous to race. And in fact, quite a lot of the rhetoric of the homosexual rights movement comes from the 70s, and they just borrowed the uh, narratives of the civil rights movement. So the civil rights movement claimed, quite rightly, that it's unfair to discriminate against particular groups of people on the basis of something that is innate, fixed, and unchosen, <laughs> like race. And they just borrowed that rhetoric and said, well, our sexuality is innate and fixed and unchosen as well. And it's actually very useful politically because it means that anyone who challenges the homosexual rights movement is the moral equivalent of a racist. So, in this view, the sexual orientation view, sexual orientation is a thing, and because all people are equal, well then we must believe that all sexual orientations are equal as well. Identity and behaviour become indistinguishable. And because sex is part of love and it's a basic human need, then we must allow for certain people that that will find a different sort of expression. And this view is um, captured by uh, former Justice Michael Kirby when he says, if the sexuality that arises from your orientation, then it is just irrational to persist with the demonization of sexual acts because they are the acts that are natural to the homosexual person to reach out for fullness of being, for love of another, for companionship and for fidelity and trust in another human being. Now this is good for heterosexual people and it is noble and wonderful in life. So just to underscore what we're being invited to believe here is that there are some people who are ontologically different to the rest of the population and they are homosexuals and their sexual behaviours flow naturally from this different ontology but in other ways it's all exactly the same. That's a bit of a whitewash on what actually goes on in male homosexual cultures, but we'll just leave that one aside for now. I'm just going to explain the belief system. So, there are some things that we agree with. Most of the people who follow the idea of born that way believe that they're standing on the high moral ground. This is just the compassionate response to the homosexual. And we're just saying that the homosexual is different, but equal. If you say diversity to this group, well, they'll still think... Um, diversity just means valuing individual difference while maintaining, maintaining equality for everyone. And if you say inclusion, well, they will say, well, it's just including a fixed minority within the existing heteronormative social order. So these, this group is still in favour of democratic pluralism, they're still supporting the family, and they're still in favour of child protection. And they are very, very convinced that this is the only way, this is the modern, up-to-date, way of regarding human sexuality. And anyone who disagrees is sort of back there with the flat earthers. And Peter Fitzsimons explained this view beautifully recently when he said, well, we used to think that people who were left-handed were an aberration, 
that they were a problem. And we used to think that people who were gay were a problem, that they were an aberration. But in the 21st century, we understand that being gay is just like being left-handed, like having red hair, like having freckles, it's no big deal. So I'm going to explain, spend a bit of time on, on the born that way idea and explain four problems with it in particular. The first is that sexual orientation is not a thing. It's many things. And sexuality researchers have always understood this. Peter Fitzsimons is speaking outside his area of expertise, I suspect. If you want to look at the arguments um, that deal with the prenatal, the, the idea that this may be uh, prenatally disposed in terms of genetics or hormones or brain structure, then I can recommend that New Atlantis um, uh, report that's up there. It goes through a number of the studies. But when we study sexual orientation, when we talk about an LGBT person, what are we actually looking at? And the problem is that there are lots of different ways that you can define sexual orientation. It could be attractions, behaviours, identity, self-label. It could mean belonging to a certain community, fantasies, felt needs for certain forms of companionship. So what do we mean when we say sexual orientation? And then when you look at any of these elements, they're quite hard to define. So if we just talk about attraction, for example, or does that mean arousal patterns or romantic feelings or desires for certain company? And then each one of those comp ideas is complex in itself. So are these feelings sporadic or permanent? Are they deep or pervasive? Are they exclusive or not? Are they shallow, intermittent? How do you measure a feeling? So the more closely you look at sexual orientation, the more you realise that it's not one thing, it's many things, and those things move around. The more you try and look at them, the harder they are to, to get into focus. But careful sexuality researchers need to map them, and they will at least look at identity and behaviours and, and attractions. And the more carefully you map those out, the less they line up. So this is how Mayer and McHugh, who wrote this report, put it. They said, the more carefully researchers map these constellations, the more complicated the picture becomes, because few individuals report uniform intercorrelations between these domains. So really what we come at is you can't put people in baskets according to sexual orientation. It's not a simple, it's not something that lends itself to a simple schema. The other problem number two with the Born That Way thesis is that even if sexual orientation were a thing, or well, so what? It doesn't actually help us to answer important questions. For example, so, so we're left asking, is the homosexual the same or different? Is the homosexual good or bad, sinful or virtuous? And these are just the wrong questions when you're dealing with people. So better questions to ask might be, must same-sex attracted people always act on those sexual attractions? For example, if a married woman goes along to her psychologist and says, um, I'm finding that I have same-sex attraction for the first time in my life, and that psychologist believes in sexual orientation, well, they will say to her, ah, you see, all these years, you, you were a lesbian and you didn't know it. And your marriage and three children, well, that's a sham and that's uh, inconsistent with an authentic version of your true life. So in order to live authentically as a lesbian, you now need to act on that sexual attraction and leave your husband and family and go and um, you know, form, form a liaison with this, with this lesbian lover. But what if she turns out to be bisexual? So if, and, and in fact this is one of the problems, that lack of understanding about sexuality has led to some very bad advice. If you just believe in identity, that these things are binary, well, then you must think, well, she, she must, she's a lesbian. That's who, you know, in order to live a happy, flourishing life, she must be true to who she really is. But what if she's bisexual and this turns out to be a passing phase? Does she need to act on it? Because if we had, for example, a heterosexual man who suddenly found that he was really sexually attracted to 20-year-olds rather than his 40-year-old wife, we wouldn't say, ah, well, that's because you're sexually oriented towards 20-year-olds. <laughs> And the only thing for you to do at this point is to leave your marriage and go and shack up with this 20-year-old. We would call that immoral and probably not conducive to human flourishing. We would call that very bad advice. And so why is it different when it's in a same-sex um, situation rather than a heterosexual situation? 
So we need to instead ask ourselves, can we live flourishing lives without acting on our sexual impulses? Does one sexual encounter establish an orientation? If a young man thinks he might be gay, what is he actually asking himself? So isn't it better just to take identity out of it and to ask instead what behaviours, whether in the sexual realm or elsewhere, tend to be conducive to health and flourishing and what kinds of behaviours tend to undermine a healthy life? So decoupling identity and behaviours is, is actually very important. Problem number three with the born that way idea is that it's just wrong because sexuality is not innate and it isn't fixed. Dr. Lisa Diamond, who is the co-editor of the American Psychological Association's handbook on sexuality and psychology, um, has done a lot of work on this. And her research was initially among uh, populations of adult same-sex attracted women. And she noticed that over time, the same women in different circumstances would change their identity, self-label, and their attraction um, <coughs> patterns changed as well. And then she replicated this research with men and found that men were sexually fluid as well. So her conclusion is that sexual orientation, which includes attraction, behaviour and identity self-label, so all three domains vary for both adolescents and for adults and for men and for women. There's a, um, I'm just going through these quickly, there's a lot more research, but this is just if people say no, no, born that way is a thing, this might be useful for you to have um, in, in the back of your brain somewhere. Uh, there's a 2006 population level survey of 2 million people in Denmark and this showed uh, a very strong correlation between the establishment of a same-sex relationship in adulthood and a parent missing in childhood, specifically the same-sex parent, so a mother if you're a girl or a father if you're a boy. And one of the things that they uh, found also was that for every year that a mother or father was missing, the chances of that child entering into a same-sex relationship in adulthood increased. So it's a very strong correlation. And their conclusion is that prenatal factors alone cannot account for the variation in human sexual orientations. Whatever ingredients determine a person's sexual preferences and marital choices, our population-based study shows that environmental factors are important. There's a national longitudinal study of uh, adolescent health in America that follows a cohort of uh, 12,000 children from the mid-1990s. And when they surveyed them when they were high school students, quite a lot of them uh, said that they experienced some sort of sexual same-sex attraction. And following up with the same cohort after the age of 25, most, the vast majority of those students did not identify as um, lesbian, gay or bisexual. Now, there's a number of reasons. Either they were same-sex attracted in puberty and were no longer same-sex attracted, or there's another theory, possibly both of these are true, that a number of them were just joking and not telling the truth when they were adolescents. One of the interesting bits of information that sort of supports that theory is that uh, several hundred of them, when they were in high school, said that they had artificial limbs, and then when they followed up with them after 25, those limbs had grown back. <laughs> Only two of them had artificial limbs. So maybe people don't always tell the truth in surveys, and we've got to sort of keep that in mind. I'll talk about the surveillance summaries um, a bit later on, but just one other piece of information that indicates very strongly that sexuality is not fixed or innate comes from um, Kinsey's research in 1948. He published The Sexuality of Sexual Behaviour of the Human Male, which sparked the sexual revolution. And in that, he had conferred with certain experts in juvenile sexuality. We would call them pedophiles. And these men said that if you wanted to cultivate a lifelong homosexual partner, it was very important to get to the boy before or during puberty. If a boy got through puberty without this instruction from an older man, then he was very likely to be heterosexual. So these people certainly didn't think that it was innate. And also, my research from the, porno uh, the pornography industry indicates very clearly that this is an industry that knows that people's sexual tastes are malleable and its uh, profits are driven by pushing people and extending them into new areas of sexual interest. So, problem number four. And this is really the biggie as far as I'm concerned. Oh, am I up to, up to the right one? Good, good. Problem number four is that if we believe born that way, it supports what I call the stigma narrative. And I'll explain the stigma narrative. It goes like this. And we, we have it in the writing themselves in research. Latrobe, when it wanted to provide a rationale for social change, 
commissioned some writers, uh, some research, if you can call it research, when you actually know the conclusions before you started. So this, this the series of reports, which is now in its fourth edition. Anyway, the writing, them, the hypothesis of this research is that same-sex attracted youth suffer high levels of verbal and physical homophobic abuse, particularly at school, and that homophobic abuse is causally related to them feeling unsafe, to excessive drug use, to self-harm and suicide attempts, and therefore we need an anti-bullying program to uh, counter the stigma that is affecting these young people. And if you believe that LGB kids are born that way, that they're different but equal, it's like red hair or freckles, but then there are differences in the life outcomes for those students, well, you must believe that it's something extrinsic to the individual. It's something societal. Something's happening to those red-headed kids that makes the red-headed kids more suicidal at this end. So it must be something about the social conditions. So that's the stigma narrative. And, you know, the research obviously was not driven by compassion or a genuine wish to help students. They say themselves we were looking to provide the rationale for social change and just looking at the list of, of uh, things that have come through the school system that James was talking about, that's the, um, the rationale, that, that, that's the, the outworking of the rationale that they provided in this report. So if we believe the stigma narrative, well then we don't look at other evidence, what else is going on for these kids, because it's just like red hair or freckles, right? So an LGB identity is not associated with any other differences, but the problem is, it is. Now you won't see it from Australian research because they obviously designed the research to answer the, to give the uh, conclusions that they already wanted, but in America when they wanted to produce this rationale, they already had a very good survey of uh, youth health related indices. Um, so rather than reinvent the wheel, they just added the LGB question to this incredible survey, and it's over um, 15,000 high school students between the ages of 14 and 17 are asked all sorts of things about their way of life. And what this shows, if you go through, so, so basically the, the people who were interested in writing this report said, look, LGB kids are, are doing badly everywhere, therefore we need an anti-bullying program. But when you look at the things that they're doing badly on, it includes these things here. So LGB kids are less likely to eat enough fruit, and they're less likely to eat enough vegetables, and they're less likely to eat breakfast or drink milk. They're less likely to have two or more glasses of water a day. They're less likely to sleep an average of eight hours a night. They're less likely to exercise. They're less likely to have seen a dentist in the last 12 months. Now, some of those might be related to stigma, except for the dentist one. I think that that really stands out to, unless you then think, well, parents don't like their LGBT kids and don't care about their teeth. And then on the other hand, LGB kids are more likely to use drugs, to suffer depression, to attempt suicide, to use computers for three or more hours a day. They're more likely to struggle with obesity. They're more likely to have had sex before the age of 13. I'll come back to that one. They're more likely to have been raped. They're more likely to have made, been made to do unwanted sexual acts by a partner in the last 12 months. That's someone they're going out with. They're more likely to have been deliberately hurt by a sexual partner in the last 12 months and they're more likely to have had sex with more than four sexual partners. So these kids are 14 to 17. So does a child that is statistically more likely to have been abused, when they go along to the school council and they say, I think I might be gay and I'm depressed, do you really think that they need a school program to help them come out and celebrate their sexuality? Is that really gonna help this kid? So actually it's leading to heartless heartless responses because we think, ah, this kid is gay, therefore there's a one-size-fits-all solution to all of their problems. So let's have a look quickly at how does child sexual abuse victimisation fit in with Born That Way, because if you believe Born That Way, it produces certain logical outcomes which actually obscure um, other logical conclusions. So we'll just take our Born That Way lenses off for a moment and have a look at the fact that children who are LGB are more likely to have been sexually abused. And how do we explain that? So there are various possibilities. They're not mutually exclusive, and there might be others, but we'll just look at these three. So we could believe that childhood sexual abuse victimisation contributes to the development of a non-heterosexual orientation in adulthood, and that's certainly what Kinsey's pedophiles would tell us. Or, number two, we could believe that children who have secret future signs of being 
gay or lesbian or bisexual um, are, are identified by abusers. They stand out to abusers for some reason. Who can tell who, who are the ones that are going to be gay? And we're going to pick on them in particular. And I think that's least likely. And then number three, we might believe that there are certain factors that contribute to both childhood sexual abuse victimisation and non-heterosexual tendencies, like a dysfunctional family or an alcoholic parent. So I think one and three are probably um, on the money. That's where we need to, to be looking, because an LGB identification often um, appears in the context of other indices of vulnerability. If we believe the stigma narrative well then, only two can be right, and we're not going to look at numbers one and three at all. So why would we do that? Why would we not be treating these kids like kids, like individuals, like people with complex histories? And in order to understand why, we need to see who else is in this conversation. The third group is the sexual rights activists. And these people do not believe born that way. They advocate for freedom to be who you really are. And that's a phrase that you'll hear quite a lot. In order to understand how these people think, how they think about the human person and the role of human sexuality, um, you're going to have to bend your mind into some uncomfortable positions. But just go with me and we'll, I'll give you the, the, the basic coordinates. For these people, the human identity is comprised of sexual orientation and gender identity. Everything about you can be expressed and understood if we just understand sexual orientation and gender identity. It's a disembodied concept of who you really are. From Kinsey, we have the idea that sexual diversity is normal because it is natural for the human animal. So, Kinsey's anthropology is wild. He thinks that basically everyone is a human animal, we're just a sort of basket of physiological responses. And the sexual response can be understood in exactly the same way as digestion, for example. We don't make moral judgments about people's digestive tracts, so why should we make moral judgments about their sexual responses? Now, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on here, but basically his is an all or nothing proposition. Either um, sexual morality is, is, we would think sexual morality is, is necessary because it harms, it protects the vulnerable. We understand that um, having sex with children hurts them. So how does Kinsey deal with that? Well, he says, well, it doesn't hurt them. Absolutely not. Of course it doesn't because it's just a, a physiological response. What hurts them is the shame and the stigma that we've associated with those sexual responses. So actually, the human animal should be free to be whoever the human animal wants to be. And what harms the human animal is actually Christian morality. So this is where we come to the real bad guys. It's been 70 years coming, but it's finally arrived. We're being beaten out of the public square because this is the ideology that is governing the sexual rights activists. But it's an all or nothing proposition. You can't say, oh, well, you know, sex with chickens, it's fine, but, um, but over here we're, we're going to make moral assumptions over here. Kinsey's is a radical idea because it says no moral assumptions are ever to be made, no moral inhibitions are ever to be applied to human sexuality. It's anything goes. And anything means anything. That means polyamory, BDSM, paedophilia, incest, bestiality, there's, there's nothing that's wrong because it's all just digestion, isn't it? This group also thinks, from a neo-Marxist point of view, that um, sexual morality is oppressive. So, um, the family, which is... Uh, th they're against heteronormativity. Heteronormativity is the idea that gender congruence and heterosexual attraction is a normal thing. And this is uh, scaffolds the family, doesn't it? Because little boys grow up in the family and they look at their fathers and they think that one day they'll quite fancy a girl and get married and they'll have children. And this is a very cunning plot of the capitalist overlords to make us reproduce the workforce. So if the family um, depends on the heterosexual monogamy, well then it's very, very important for the interests of liberation that we should all be free from the shackles of this oppression and free to uh, enjoy our, our sexual diversity and gender diversity. And they also believe that because a, a queer minority can never be included in a world that is patterned on heteronormative expectations. They will always be othered. And so really what we need is the queer revolution for everybody to be included and then we can all be queer together. So this is then repatterned on what I call queer normativity. It's a, such an ugly word, but it describes it really well. So who are these people and what do they want? Because 
most of the people who believe in uh, sexual orientation are, are nice people. You know, they're your left-leaning social justice warriors. That's even the liberal church believes that sexual orientation is a thing and we need to just be compassionate to people. But it's much harder to redeem the worldview of the sexual rights activists and to give them a clean bill of moral health because they are, um, they'll pretend that they're interested in the welfare of people and they're arguing for rights all over the place, but I actually think they're quite nasty people when you get down to it. So who are they? They are the militant gay lobby, who used to be called the Gay Liberation Front, and they'll argue for LGBT rights. There are the sex industry, so pornography, sex toy shops, and they argue for sex workers' rights. The abortion uh, providers and health, the sexual health providers are in here as well. So this is a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. Pedophiles and their advocates, and they argue for children's sexual rights. And then there are Marxists and queer revolutionaries, and there's the latest generation of non-binary priesthood of superheroes who think Judith Butler is really cool and want to liberate everyone from the oppression of heteronormativity. One of the things that's really important to notice about this is that these are the same people making the same arguments for all the same rights. You can't distinguish them. So you'll get, you know, some people might be especially Marxist, but they're still sympathetic with the, the pedophiles and the sex workers' rights because they're all coming from the same understanding of the human person and the same uh, understanding of human sexuality. So they're all making the stigma arguments. And I think this is quite interesting when you understand how the stigma arguments work in different contexts. If we look at sex workers' rights, for example, some of the arguments that have been advanced in our parliaments are, well, we've noticed that sex workers have very high levels of PTSD. Well, how do you explain that? Because these are empowered sex workers, right? It's nothing to do with the sex, clearly. The fact that it is the same, indistinguishable from sexual harassment and rape, well, that's got nothing to do with it because these women are professionals and they're just exercising their empowered autonomy. So if they suffer from PTSD, how do we explain that? Well, it must be stigma. It must be those nasty people who tell them that they're victims and who tell them that sex work is not a respectable profession. So what we need to um, reverse this PTSD for women, to make life better for them, or we need to celebrate um, uh, sex work and have more visibility of it. And these, these are serious arguments being advanced in the parliaments. So who is the bad guy? Well, it's the people who are against the proliferation of the sex industry. They're the nasty ones because they're actually hurting the prostitutes, you see. Sexual rights for children, if you listen into the narratives of pedophiles, and I don't recommend it because it doesn't make for a good night's sleep, but pedophiles believe that children are sexual from birth. That's an appeal to the ontology of children. That's just natural for children to be curious about sex. So then when we notice that children are traumatised by sexual contact with adults, well, how do we explain that? Well, it's because they've been shamed, you see. They've been shamed for being curious about sex, which is actually quite natural for them. So in this view, who is hurting the child? Christians, parents, teachers, actually anyone who thinks that sex with children is not a good idea. So you see how the moral universe is completely inverted when you come at it from this point of view. So what do we need? Well, we need to advocate for children's sexual rights. And then, again, you'll see that this, this is the same narrative that's used in the LGBT rights movement. So LGBT kids are suicidal and harming themselves, and this can't possibly be anything to do with, with being LGBT, because that's just like having red hair and freckles. So um, who is to blame? And it's obviously society. So it's important to realise that these arguments are advanced by people who have personal, commercial, or political reasons for um, uh, an interest in the sexual exploitation of the vulnerable. They are advocating for freedom for the vulnerable to come forth and be exploited. And just to see you, just to show you how um, powerful this is as a political weapon, because they're bringing the sexual orientationists along with them, we need to understand why would they be uh, promoting the idea of sexual orientation when actually that's not what they believe. And the reason that they do that is because it gives them this very useful common ground. Because the sexual orientationists and the sexual diversity crowd both believe that an LGBT identification is not in itself a sign of brokenness. And if it's not a sign of brokenness, it's like red hair or freckles, well then it must be stigma, you see. 
So I'll just show you how effective this is as a political tool for the far left. If we think about recruitment to an LGBT identity, do you think you can make somebody LGBT? And of course, the sexual orientation, I still say, well, that's ridiculous, because of course you can't. It's fixed from birth, and the sexual diversity people will say, well, of course you can, and it's very essential that you do, because that's the equivalent of liberating them from heteronormativity. If we look at the issue of conversion therapy, and we talk to the sexual orientationists, they'll say, well, it's ridiculous to have conversion therapy because it's futile, and actually you're just cementing the idea that a homosexual identity is not a good thing. So I think that's a strange argument, because if you had red hair and freckles and you were unhappy about it, surely you could go and talk to a counsellor. But they will say, no, 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 because it's increasing stigma, so we'll ban conversion therapy. And the sexual diversity people will say, um, we don't want conversion therapy because all you're trying to do is to stuff the liberated people back into their little heteronormative boxes, and that's not good. What if we come upon the issue of comprehensive sexuality education? What about teaching kids in high school all about gay sex? Well, the sexual orientationists will say, well, we know that there are some kids in the class who are LGBT and we need to look after their sexual health as well. So it's necessary and it's not going to affect the heterosexual kids because their sexual orientation is fixed as well. And the sexual diversity crowd believe that comprehensive sexuality education is essential because we want to teach sexual diversity to everyone, everywhere, and that gives us a megaphone to speak to kids in the school system. What about safe schools? Well, the sexual orientationists think that it's an anti-bullying program, and the sexual diversity people believe that it's necessary to disrupt heteronormativity in the school system. What about, what do we think about religious schools? Well, the sexual orientationists think that this is harmful and discriminatory against the fixed minority of LGBT people, and the sexual diversity people have identified this for at least the last 20 years as a major obstacle to the queer revolution. So when you're talking to these people, you'll hear them use the words abusive parent, homophobia, inclusion, diversity, hate speech, and we think we're speaking the same language. But in fact, what the problem is, we're using the same words to mean completely different things. So if you talk to the sexual orientation people and you say abusive parent, well, they'll probably understand that the way we would understand it. But if you, if you talk to the sexual diversity people and say abusive parent, well, that's someone who wants to protect their children from pedophilia. Inclusion, diversity, the same thing. Is that clear? You can see how the same words mean different things depending on which ideology you filter them through. So I'm coming into land now. You've, you've done very well. This is the last slide. No, it isn't the last slide because the last slide's not there. Never mind. <laughs> so in all of this, what becomes clear is that the useful idiot, that the, the um, born that way people are useful idiots. They're being dragged along they're marching in a rainbow parade, but they haven't understood who is actually running that parade. And this term, useful idiots, was used by Lenin, of Americans who went to the Soviet Union and came back saying how marvelous communism was. They actually hadn't understood it very well, but they were useful idiots. They were promoting something that they didn't really understand very fully, but that helped the communists. And this is exactly what's going on here. So the sexual orientationists, the people that believe born that way, are, are being dragged along with the parade. But underneath the glitter and the feathers of the rainbow parade, there's a very nasty agenda to recruit the vulnerable into sexualized cultures. They offer them freedom to be who you really are, but actually they're grooming people into a life of degradation and exploitation. So we need not be ashamed of refusing to march in the rainbow parade, and this is how we as Christians can retake the moral high ground. Because we agree with sexual rights activists, we agree that polymorphous sexual expression is possible for everyone. We just don't think it's a very good idea. And we agree that LGB suffering is real. And we believe that it comes from the lifestyles and the cultures and the, the background trauma that needs to be dealt with if we're going to be a compassionate society. So we come back to the Christian view of the human person and the place of human sexuality being the best protection for the individual, whether they're LGB or not. The human person is more than a sexual identity. All people are equal. All sexual behaviours do not have equally good outcomes and all sexual cultures are not equally conducive to human flourishing. Thank you for listening.